Hello, my name is Chauncey Winter from Power Curve Inc. And this is the fourth video in our free tutorial series on top down design with Pro Engineer Wildfire. And this tutorial is called Creating Skeletons from Your Design Layout. Where we left off at the last video was that we had developed a complete skeleton. And in fact, if we go to our top level assembly and look at our model tree, we only have one skeleton part in here which accomplishes the entire layout in the case of a rocket. And as we've said before, a rocket is a simpler example than many because everything can be designed. All the key features that coordinate the different teams uh, and the different stages can be defined in one plane. If your product doesn't allow that, it's a little more complicated to, to control your display and imagery, but the concepts are all the same. We have a single skeleton, and at this point, we did not have to or want to worry about what the bill of material structure had to be for the final rocket. We just wanted to design and figure out how things need to be coordinated. At this point, however, we do have to be concerned with uh, what the different, what the top level bill of materials is going to look like for the production assembly. And in the case of a rocket, we, we want to, in order to support the years of development that would happen for a rocket, we need to make sure that we design this bill of materials by our engineering needs, because our production needs, you cannot possibly anticipate years ahead of time. You, of course, you have ideas, but what you do know for sure are your engineering needs. And in the case of a rocket, our engineering needs are that functionally, this rocket must really be a number of rockets. First, it's the rocket that exists at launch. Then, at some point, a whole, the whole first stage comes off, and anything that is a mass on that first stage, we want to also be removed from the rocket, only leaving behind what's still functional. Now we have to have another functional vehicle left behind, which is our stage two. So functionally, it's a little bit like a very simple mechanism, although nothing moves or rotates with respect to each other. The reality is my stage one and stage two are kind of links in an assembly. And in fact, there's another link in the assembly, which is the payload fairing that protects the payload, which actually also at some point separates once we're out of the atmosphere. So what do I get out of this is that I, as the project architect, am very clear that for this rocket, I need to be able to support the design of three mass separation groups. The first group of mass that comes off is everything with the payload fairing. The second group, which will become the second top level assembly, is going to be the booster that has to drop off, leaving behind a functional second stage with the payload. And then the final group that really comes off uh, at the end of the mission is the payload pops off itself. Okay, so I know that I need three skeletons that will coordinate these different teams so that as the strength people or the business development people tell us to change diameters or lengths of fuel tanks or booster stages or payloads which affect bearings, that when we change this one layout, this one single skeleton file, it will then subsequently update the other three files and that information then will get passed down to production assemblies, which will be shown in a, in a different video of this series. So what's involved? The one thing I've added since we left off the last design, is, or the last video, is I have added coordinate systems to make it very easy to assemble my new skeletons. Again, looking at this, my, my static layout, now if you have dynamic layouts, that's a whole other thing which we will not cover in these video series. But if, you have a stat if a static layout meets all of your needs, I currently have one skeleton model. What I'm going to do is now have to add three more skeleton models, which will in fact be the ones which will be used by production assemblies and any other assembly, even analysis assemblies that are going to be doing studies on the different stages. Okay. So what I wanted to do is give myself, I had to decide where do I want the coordinate systems for these different mass separation groups. And I chose to create a coordinate system here, so I did this again offline because it's still not too exciting to watch. And I created another one here. Those are simply features, and let's go back to the part skeleton. Those coordinate systems, 
are simply coordinate systems in the original static layout skeleton. So let's start creating some new skeletons now. The first one functionally that has to pop off is the payload fairing, which covers the payload during the launch. So I have to go to my assembly. Now you'll have to have a setting set up. By default, an assembly can only accept a single skeleton. If you are doing project layouts, and in fact, if you, I would recommend that many companies, if people are trained, should turn on the, the config pro option that allows multiple skeleton files to be used. Okay, that's what we're going to take advantage of here. If you don't change that function, you will not be able to even do what you're watching me do. And so now I'm going to say in the assembly, I'm going to say create a new skeleton model. And I'm going to call this, I'm not going to take the default, I'm going to call this mass separation group 1 skeleton. Of course, the name's somewhat arbitrary, but this is actually how I think of this particular design functionally. And when I have people designing production models, I want them to be thinking in terms of should their component be assembled to mass separation group 1 or mass separation group 2 or mass separation group 3. Because I want them to assemble it in the right assembly so that it supports all the downstream analyses um, that are going to be required. Okay. Now it asks me for a start part. And in fact, I always integrate this stuff with Mechanica. So I always use a Mechanica start model that's got some features that help me with analysis. Okay, so we're doing that. Copy from. Okay. And since I pre-created these coordinate systems, it's going to be a trivial matter, matter for me to simply um, align coordinate system of this, and I'll want to eventually rename that to match skeleton coordinate system MSG1 there. If we look at our model tree, there's our mass separation group one. It's now the second skeleton in the assembly. We open that skeleton up. It will be nothing but the start original, my original start part that I use for parts. Nothing else is in it. If you look at the model tree, there's your model tree for mass separation group one skeleton. So what I need to do now, like I said, now we need to be concerned with what geometry has to be passed to the design groups and therefore we have to be paying attention to um, what is supposed to happen in each top level assembly because that's what I'm trying to coordinate, the teams involved in the top level assembly. So we're going to go back to here. Now, the next thing I need to talk about is in the tools menu under assembly settings, and then I go reference control. Hopefully most of you are set up by your companies so that you can only make references to other skeleton models. Because if you don't do this, most people will crisscross their parts with just an ungodly array of external references. It is true that as a project administrator, you would often want to be able to use the all function. But the reality is everything I'm showing in this video series assumes that a company has wisely set this as a default behavior. And in fact, to do what I'm going to do doesn't require a change of that because I am only working with skeleton models to develop this whole architecture. So what I now want to do is I want to say I want to take this model and activate it. And now I'm going to say insert, share data, copy geometry. Now, worth another conversation here. There could be a temptation, and it has some advantages for sure, of in fact, of in fact just bringing this entire skeleton into each of the three top-level mass separation group assemblies, the top-level assemblies. And then the advantage of that is all the changes that update or as new coordinate systems or datums or points are created, they will automatically be transferred into your assemblies. However, it really messes up your zoom scale. If you have 
sub certain subassemblies, like the first one, in fact, the first mass separation group is only this big, and to carry all this luggage along, it is it just messes up everybody's view display for one thing. If you deal with mechanisms where things change relative to each other, where the different stages, it doesn't happen in this case, but if they rotate with respect to each other, it would be very disconcerting to see four full models rotating around each other in space. So some models, that's absolutely fine. You can do that on your own. I'm going to show you the somewhat more complicated but also somewhat more appropriate methodology of splitting out these different sections to different models. Okay, so we're going to do copy geometry. Okay, I'm going to turn off this publish feature, and then I'm going to start grabbing the references. And the references, I can grab any references from here, but the ones that make sense for me to pull into this particular um, assembly is the actual space claim for the payload is going to be helpful for me to understand. So I'm going to bring that one in. And then whatever curves are, are make up the payload fairing outline. So I'm going to grab a chain here. So I'll go from here. Oh, the whole thing's one curve. So that's very convenient for me. So uh, I actually want that entire thing and nothing else. So that will work out just fine. All right. And so we will say, OK. and we will save our work and what we have now accomplished is we have for the payload group we now have created the skeleton that will integrate them with the top of stage two and if we look at that 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 uh, geometry now has those items in it and then they can choose to start thickening and revolving these features to make the composite shell um, and splitting it, deciding if that shell should be two pieces or three pieces, and what clocking and so forth. And as anyone who knows ProEngine knows, I don't even need to bother demonstrating this, but as we saw in an earlier video, if anything is done to my layout where the requirements for the payload change, for example, to become longer or higher, that is going to update the layout geometry curve, and that consequently is going to get pushed down into this model and in one of our subsequent videos we will actually have to show I believe it's the next video in fact um, how the actual production model production design people are to utilize this so that their parts and assemblies actually update to any changes so I hope this has been a useful video for you and thank you for your time